top two levels and have everybody sitting in one level like this. So, wartime Shakespeare was classless, patriotic propaganda. Why, for example, so if you came into the theatre, <coughs> what could you expect to see? If you came to the theatre of a lunchtime in 1940, you would come for one hour, not three hours. Between the hours of one o'clock and two o'clock. And you would see a performance of Shakespeare's greatest hits. What do I mean by Shakespeare's greatest hits? I mean that you would hear all of Shakespeare's greatest speeches all together in a one hour exclusive presentation. So you would get to be or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the etc. You would get all the world to stay and all the men and women merely players from as you like it. You would get from the Scottish play. <laughs> I mustn't say the word, the Scottish play. It's a seven letter word beginning with M. I mustn't say the word because for a Brit, it's bad luck to say it. <laughs> Honestly, straight up, it's bad luck. I can't say it. So the hero of this Scottish play, you get speeches from that. You would get the speech from Henry V. Why is it bad luck? Because there's a curse on the theatre, that's why. You would get the speech from Henry V. And you would get a speech from King Lear, which I'll come to in a moment. And in between, you would get nice little bits of music. It was a lover and his lass. <laughs> Played on a lute or something. So you would have music and speeches. If you went to the theatre at that time, you could drink coffee in the theatre. You could eat sausage rolls in the theatre. <laughs> and you could have ham sandwiches. Now, that may sound boring, but at that particular time, food was rationed. In other words, there wasn't a lot of food around. So Wolfit, the actor manager, he had to spend a lot of money on ham to be acquired on the black market. In other words, acquired illegally in order to provide ham sandwiches. So, think of that. On a Monday morning at 9 a.m., you perhaps have to listen to a three-hour lecture or a two-hour lecture, they say, whatever. <laughs> In a lunchtime Shakespeare, you would listen to a one-hour performance and you could drink coffee, eat your sandwiches, and you could have ham, and you may not get ham at home. So there's a good excuse to come to the theater so as to eat your ham sandwiches <coughs> and have propaganda at the same time. Have propaganda with your ham. <laughs> so that was another reason why people came. So you would hear Shakespeare, you would listen to Shakespeare music, and you would eat your food. But you have to remember that in 1940, the style of Shakespeare speaking was a bit different from what it is today. Some of you may have seen Shakespeare on the state theatre stages earlier this season. Others of you may have seen Shakespeare movies. This particular actor, Donald Wolfitt, was an old-fashioned actor. He was someone whose roots went back to the mid-19th century. He was an actor manager. He believed in the great tradition of the British theatre, and his style of verse speaking 
was very much influenced by past history. And so the way in which he would speak his speeches was very different from what you would hear today. Why? Because he believed that the old ways were the best. And I thought I would just take five minutes or so to give you an example of how a Shakespearean speech might have been spoken by Sir Donald Wolfitt at that time. It's from King Lear. Those of you who don't know King Lear, let me just quickly explain. King Lear has been cast out onto the heath, onto some land in the middle of a storm. He's been rejected by his three daughters. He is all on his own, and he blames the universe for what has happened to himself. Now, you will have to imagine that in the background, there is a thunder sheet. There is thunder in the background. There is wind in the background. And King Lear, who is this 80-year-old monarch, comes in and gives this speech, which starts like this. Blow, winds, and crack your cheeks. Rage, blow, you cataracts and hurricanes, spout, till you have drenched the steeples, drowned the cocks. You sulfurous and thought executing fires, formed couriers to oak cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white head, <coughs> excuse me, and thou all shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the world, crack nature's mold. All Germans spill at once that make him grateful man. Rumble my bellyful, spit fire, spout rain, not rain, wind, thunder, fire are my daughters. I tax, tax not you, you elements with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you children. You owe me no subscription. Why then, let fall your horrible pleasure. Here I stand, your slave, a poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. But yet, I call you servile ministers that have with two pernicious daughters joined your high and gendered battle against a head so white as this. Oh, tis foul. What I was doing was, <laughs> if you notice, I was holding the voice like that. And if for those who didn't get the pronunciation, I was saying that instead of that. I was using E instead of A. That is what is called old fashioned marked pronunciation. And that is old fashioned acting. <laughs> Honestly, this is true. If you ever listen to the Queen, Elizabeth, you have noticed that she speaks in this accent because that was actually considered to be the best accent in the 1940s. And so Donald Wilfitt wants to be actually quite popular but also traditional. And so Donald Wilfitt is speaking like that deliberately. Now, my question to you would be, 
how and why could that sort of thing be London's biggest hit of 1940 and 1941? How on earth could an hour of Shakespeare read at lunchtime attract such attention so that Donald Wilfit became a really big London star. I mean, it sounds silly, doesn't it? This is where I think you have to think of the context in which it takes place. If you are in a theatre, if you've got bombing outside, if you are together with people in a theatre, with your actors on the stage, you may get the sense of collective security. Everybody feels secure in a theater. If a bomb strikes the theater, hey, we all go together. <laughs> true, true, true. But if we don't, we are all together in the theater, and we have survived in the theater. So there's this sense of collectiveness. Number two, he is the only person at the time for six weeks who is putting on any theatre shows. There is no television. There is limited amount of radio on one programme, perhaps two. There are no cinemas for five weeks. There are no theatres. <laughs> So he is the only person putting a show on. Number three, he is charging low prices and telling people, come and have a ham sandwich. <laughs> now you're thinking to yourself, eh, jambon, don't care, just can go to a bundera and buy it. But remember, at that time, ham is rationed. There is no ham. So if you have no ham, and a theatre manager is saying, here's ham, we're coming for it. Theatre managers don't always have to be artistic to attract audiences. They need commercialism as well. And four, I didn't impersonate Donald Wilfit very well, but if you've got a big star who is on the stage speaking Shakespeare, talking to an audience, trying to make it understandable to everybody, it becomes quite attractive. So you have all of these things, and what happens as a result is that Shakespeare becomes box office. Shakespeare becomes the hit. 324 years after his death, he becomes box office again. And it is true to say that it was as a result of Donald Wolfe's wartime Shakespeare that a famous film called Henry V came about in 1944 with a famous actor called Laurence Olivier doing Henry V. So it was basically the actions of a touring actor manager with no money, a small company, one chair, and a few Shakespearean speeches that made Shakespeare box office once more. And on that note, I will finish. Thank you very much.